So I love that little phrase, the means of making decisions in the presence of the Lord. Everybody has a means of making decisions. Everyone has a way that they try to figure out where is this going? Can I trust this person? And I like this method a lot because all the priests had to do was take out the stones. The thamim, it stands for perfection or decision. And then he would take Urim, which represents light, which always represents revelation, which always represents knowledge. And when God would speak through these stones, you would inquire of him. And if the answer was affirmative, Urim would light up and you would know God wants us to do it. Like when David was facing a battle at Ziklag and he had to go back and recover his, his, his family and, and the families of his men, and he asked the priest, bring me an ephod because I need to seek the Lord. Because if I go into this battle and God doesn't want me to go in this battle, if I do this venture, if I go after this thing and God doesn't want me to do this thing, I'll be defeated. But if he says yes, no power in hell can stand against me. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. So David said, bring me the ephod. Because if God gives me light on this situation, I can fight this battle. If God gives me light on this situation, I can stand the trial. I can stand the test. I can pass it. I can do it if God says yes. But sometimes God would say no. And then sometimes the stone would do nothing. And what that meant was God doesn't want to answer this right now. In other words, if I can take you back to middle school, I love you. Do you love me? Check. Yes or no. And sometimes I would put a third box called maybe. And sometimes they would ask God, you know, should we go? Should we stay? Should we do it? Should we not? And the son would do nothing. What do you do with them? Maybe. Because a lot of times in our life, don't you wish you had a Urim and a Thamim in your closet? Come on, right next to your belts. I'd rather have a Urim and a Thamim than a Rolex. I mean iced. I'd rather have I would I would love if I could what a what a what a blessing it would be. You know how many you know how many staff members I never would have hired to begin with? Come on, this is a big church. Can I be real with you? Do you know how many staff members I just be, if I could have just had that special stone, pull it out. Wouldn't that be cool? Can you imagine how how many how many things would you have done differently and how helpful would it be when you're making decisions if you could just have a stone just to light up and tell you, yes, this is God. You know how your kids start hanging out with friends and you're wondering, like, I don't know about these parents. They seem kind of like, I don't know, I, I smelled something on their clothes. It smelled like it might have been weed or maybe it was a, something else, but I'm not sure. Lord, should I let my kids hang out with these kids? And God says, yes, and you could get some sleep. Or, you know, God, should I take this job? It's got more pay, but it's going to mean more hours. I just think it would be so cool if it would light up and, and tell me. And, and yet God, God, God knows something about me that I don't know about me, is that even if he gave me the light to know what to do, a lot of times I wouldn't have the faith to do it. You're going to make me preach by myself and sit there looking at me like I'm an entertainer? You know the truth is that even sometimes when you know what to do, even sometimes when you know this is God, and, and they had these stones, they, they had these stones that was behind the breastplate, and the breastplate was under the pomegranate tree, and the priest was doing nothing with it. They had the means of making decisions to know the will of God, but their fear had put them in a place, and their complacency had put them in a place. Because when you have the instruments but you don't use them, how can God speak to you when you can't find this between Sundays? How can God give you his wisdom? And the important thing about it was, Jonathan said, we don't have the ephod. Ahijah has the ephod. We don't have a complete clarity on this situation. But what he had that was so important, he had the right person to turn to and talk about it. I need you to understand the value not only of what God says to you in your life, but about who you say it to after God says it to you. 
The right people will give you the go-ahead. The right people will say, you know what? I'm going to help you as you do this. I know the addiction has got you about three different cycles now, and it looks like this one won't be any different, but whether or not you make it, I'm going to be here with you on it, so let's go ahead and do this dumb thing, this impossible thing, this crazy thing. And then sometimes they got to turn and tell you, that ain't God at all, but it's who you say it to. It's who you say it to. It's a 50-50 thing. It's not just my relationship with God. It's my relationship with others. And a lot of us are suffering in silence in our relationship with God because we're living in bitterness with our relationship with others. You can't hear God just like this. I guarantee you, if Jonathan would have had an armor bearer who told him, you know what, man? Let me know how that turns out. I'm praying for you. Sign of the cross. I guarantee you the battle wouldn't have moved on beyond Bethaven that day like it did. Mm -mm. And even for me, I can say this. When people say, how did you know God wanted you to start a church? I read a book. I felt inspired. I got up and preached. It seemed to help people. Read a book. I got a wife. We were doing our thing. One day she looked at me in the mountains of Tennessee. We were at some youth camp. Carl Carty was leading worship. We came back to the room. People say, When how did you know? How did God speak to you? It was time for you to start the church. Because I wanted to start it when I was 40. The church wouldn't even be here right now. If Holly didn't turn to me, not God. She was my Yareem. God used her like that. She said, It's time for you to go start this church. I said, When I'm 40. She said, No. Now, look, JJ, if you hear me saying on this message, you know, God's calling you to go. You know how many people I've seen go start coffee shops because they like coffee? And they hear a message like this and abuse it, and they think that the whole point of the message is just go do the dumbest thing you can think of that you have a halfway interest in, and then blame the devil when it doesn't work out because it was spiritual warfare and attack, and nobody believed in my dream, and I'm nothing but a Jesus on the cross, some garden of Gethsemane, squeezed like the olives and the oils coming out. All of that is dumb because I'm not even talking about that. I'm talking about who you talk to about what God is saying to you. And now, now I get to return the favor. I mean, the other day she she turned to me and was like. Um, hey, um, I'm about to tell you something that I think God is speaking to me because it's always a 50 50 thing. Always. Always. So, so I'm confident, I'm, but I'm not certain, you know? And she was like, um, Don't laugh at me. I'm like, Why would I laugh at you? Tell me. And what she told me, I said, Not only have you got to do that, but you got to do this, this, and this, and this, and this, because that's awesome. Then I think she was sorry that she told me because she didn't want to do this, 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 and this, and this. She just wanted to do that. But we started talking. And you see how important it is? Not only what God says to you, it's not only this beam of the cross, but it's this one too. So I don't have Yurim and Thameem, but I got. Eugene. <laughs> I needed a rhyme. It was um, it was a stretch at best. And Irene, and uh, and I got people. Now this is so this is so key. It's a 50-50 faith. It's a 50-50. That means it is a divine partnership. Where Jonathan says, you know, there is something that God can do, and then there is something that God will not do that only we can do. Faith is 50-50. James proves it clearly. Not only does Jonathan exemplify it, James explains it when he says faith without works is it takes two. This is a 50-50 proposition. Why would God do for you what he gave you the strength to do for you? It is a 50-50 faith. It is not my faith that saves me, and I'm grateful for that. How many are grateful that your faith in Christ for salvation is not 50-50? 
Come on, because if it was, I would be in hell before Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. But because he is my great high priest, y'all, I'm about to get happy on this sermon. And because he took the breastplate of his own righteousness into the most holy place and shed his blood on the mercy seat, I don't ever have to doubt if he wants to see me or hear me or love me or throw his arms around me. He is my righteousness and I am his child and he is my great high priest. Come on, shout about it like you got the good sense to know. This thing doesn't depend on me. Foundational faith, even that faith is the gift of God so that no one can boast. But watch this, Jonathan said, perhaps, perhaps the Lord will. It's 50-50. <laughs> I know he can. I think he will. 50-50. I know God is with me, and I think this is where he's leading me. It's 50-50. I'm a 50-50 leader. I pulled 70 staff in this Monday and said, this is what I think God's doing, and I can't put a bow on it, but we're going to find out together. Why? Because God won't reveal truth if I don't move toward it. Ever. And the issue is this. Experience is the friend of wisdom, but it can be the enemy of faith. You need me to run that back? Yes. Experience is the friend of wisdom. But if you get like Saul and Ahijah and keep the ephod under the pomegranate tree, Jonathan said, We're going to have to be our own ephod. We're going to have to put ourselves out there and see if God will. And when Eugene Peterson, he had this idea, right? He was trying to preach the, the, the Bible. He's in heaven now, but he was trying to preach the Bible to his church. He realized that they weren't really getting it. So he sat down to write a translation of the Bible in a way they could understand. You know that little version on your Bible on your phone? I hope you got the Bible on your phone. I hope you got the Bible up above Facebook on your phone. Because you need that one to start your day. You really do. You really do. You don't need to know what's going on in Russia every second, but you need to know what's happening, what God intends for your life. And and if you click on it, there will be one, one version that says MSG, and it has nothing to do with a Chinese restaurant. It's the, it's the message translation, and it was written by a man who was just… He had an idea. What if I write the Bible in the language that's common to the people? And he ended up translating the whole Bible that way, the message translation, all because maybe God will use this. you know. If you act on it, if you act, it's 50 50. It's 50 50. I'm not sure. I don't know. Look what he said when he translated 1 Samuel 14 6, my favorite verse about faith in the Old Testament. Look what he said that Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come on now. Come on now. Let's do it now. Not when the priest gets his act together. Not when the government gets this act together. Not when, but now we got to do this. Now, now, come on now. Let's go across to these uncircumcised pagans. And then he said, The title of my series, Maybe God Will Work for Us. Maybe. Maybe. Faith is being able to move. On a maybe. And you know what that means? It's 50 50. It might not work, but God is always working. I'm confident in the second, even when I'm not certain in the first. And it takes the kind of faith, church, to say, maybe. Maybe if I do this, maybe, and, 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 and maybe it won't. And maybe God will use this thing that I think I'm supposed to do to lead to something that I was really supposed to do, so that even if the first thing fails, at least I'm not sitting still in fear, but it takes faith to move on a maybe. 
when your reem has gone dark and Saul is under a tree and, and you don't know what to do but to move toward it, God says move toward it. It may work and even if it doesn't, I will. It is the power to move on a maybe, to know that God is mystery, but he is revealed. His character is trustworthy. I can move on a maybe. Father, I don't want to do this, but nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So I'm going to go see about this and maybe, somebody shout maybe. Maybe. I've got a maybe faith. Enough faith to do it and not know the conclusion, but trust God in the process. It's a maybe faith. I'm confident. I'm not certain, but I'm confident. And, and you will find yourself many times in your life in a maybe moment. Some of you are there right now. It's a maybe moment for you. Maybe you are giving yourself to a marriage that you don't know if it can live like Ezekiel in the Valley of Bones. You don't even know if anything's going to happen, but you're prophesying and speaking forth and believing God to send the winds, and you're living in the maybe moment. Maybe if we start a church. Maybe. Maybe. I, I know who God is, and I know nothing can stop him, but it's 50-50, man. You want to do it anyway? Maybe. The miracle is in the maybe. I wish I could preach this to every discouraged heart today. God lives in a place called maybe. Faith lives in a place called maybe. So if you are in a maybe moment today, that's where God lives. Hey, thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And share this video with a friend. And don't forget, you can join me live every Sunday. Thanks again for watching.